So you're negotiating with a narcissist and you're just, ugh, the games, they don't stop. They do not stop. It is like this game that you are stuck in that it's like a freaking nightmare. Like, when can you get out of this thing, right? I mean, how do you get out of a narcissist game? How do you, how do you stay out of a narcissist game? Like, if you are feeling like you're being pulled in, you're being sucked in, you feel it like a like a tide that's sucking you in, um, and uh, you want to stay out of it. I've been there. I felt like that sucking. I felt I felt it. How do you stay out of that? I figured it out. I figured it out. You know, I, I've had to deal with them not not just in negotiations, but in my personal life as well. And, and not just as the target, because I've had to deal with a couple of them where I've been targeted, a couple of covert narcissists, uh, but also just like around me, because don't you feel like, they, like they're around you, like everywhere? I, I have felt it when they've started to draw me in. And now, now that I can spot them from a mile away, I know what the one trait is that keeps me myself to protect myself. To, to stay out of their games. And by the way, if you want lots and lots of tips and tricks on how to stay powerful uh, and stay uh, strong in dealing with narcissists, uh, feel free to subscribe to this channel and hit that notification bell. Okay, so you're still, you wanna stay above the fray. You don't wanna play into their triggers, okay? Um, because they, they do wanna trigger you. You know why? Because it, it gives them supply. You know, they're like rats in a maze with the cheese. Like there's that one thing that is the only thing that they're going for at all times is that narcissistic supply. And yes, there's a hierarchy. Yes, there's the grade A and then there's like, you know, the coal level and like, you know, there's different levels of supply for them. Of course, there's like the better version and then there's like the whatever. Uh, but they'll, they'll take anything. They're definitely... Ver, you know, vultures, they'll take any level of supply they can get. But do you want to stay above the fray, right? You want to be like the untouchable supply, the one they're trying to get, but they can't quite get their hands on it. They can't, they want it, but you just keep slipping out of their hands. They can't quite get you. That's the supply that you want to be. They want you, but you're not touchable. You're not reachable. All right. So um, it's, it's sort of like the level, you know, where you're trying to get them to respect you. It's kind of like that. I have a video on the only way to get a narcissist to respect you, by the way. Um, and you can definitely check that out too. It's sort of like that, but it, it's, it's along the same lines. Like you don't want to take their bait. Um, that's definitely one of those traits. Um, cause they, they, they will try so hard to trigger you. They will try so hard to trigger you. They'll send you those long, long emails saying all sorts of things. They know what your emotional triggers are. They know what your Achilles heels are. They know how to say things that are going to make you want to respond to each and every point. How could you say this about me? How could you say that? that's not true. And this is what's true. And that's, this is the fact. And how could, here's proof and here's proof and here's proof and here's proof. Okay. You don't need to do all of that. You do not need to do all of that. That plays into exactly with it. Now you're down in the mud with them. You just need to say I'm in receipt of your email. I deny what you're saying. Here's the only thing I need to respond to, which is, you know, I'll see you at three o'clock on Wednesday or whatever it is that you need to respond to. Those are the types of games that they play. Don't take the bait. In fact, I want you to comment right now. I won't take the bait. That's your mantra for today. I won't take the bait, right? I want to see the comment below. So I know that you're listening. I won't take the bait. So remember, they don't have any sense of self. They don't have a strong sense of self. So what is the one trait that really is the best, the best thing that makes you like so 
untouchable, like the like you're the Dalai Lama against a narcissist. You have a strong sense of self. You know who you are. You are secure in yourself as a person. You have nothing to prove. That is quite literally the opposite of a narcissist. It is the other end of the spectrum. They have zero sense of self. You have a complete secure sense of who you are as a person. You feel good about yourself. You don't have to prove anything to anyone. You are a good person. You want to help people. You know that giving doesn't take away from yourself, that when other people succeed, it doesn't have anything to do with you. You can champion them. You know, all of the things that they're not. Um, that is really the one trait that completely keeps you out of their games because you're not competing with them. I mean, narcissists want to compete with you and you're just like, I'm not competing. I'm not part of your game. I'm not, this is not who I am. Um, that is truly the opposite of what the narcissist is. The more you can educate yourself, the more you can arm yourself, the more you know about this, the less worried you're going to be about it, the less scared you're going to be about it, the less anxiety you're going to have around this because you are going to understand that this is a personality disorder. So you're not going to take it personally. You're going to start to see the symptoms. You're going to start to recognize this is what's going on. You're going to start to look at them as like a two-year-old having a tantrum on the floor. You're going to start to go, oh, there it is. It's not me. You are going to see the signs, the red flags. You're going to start to understand that they don't have the capacity to have empathy for others. And you're going to recognize that some are covert, some are overt, some are grandiose, that they have this certain way that they go into relationships, the love bombing, the devaluing, the discarding, all of those things. And by the way, I have videos on all of these things and you can check them out on my channel right here. But we'll start to see these patterns and you're going to start to be able to recognize what's going on and your these light bulbs are going to start going off in your head and you're going to go wow oh my goodness i can't believe that this is what is happening that this is who this is and you're going to understand there's no reason to be triggered because not only not only are they doing this to get a high out of it and be, you know, get their, their narcissistic supply out of it, but they're also doing this to use your reaction against you, especially if you are negotiating with them, especially if there's something at stake, especially if there's a reason to try to use that against you in some way, because they're going to try to use that as leverage. A hundred percent. I've seen it all the time. I've seen it all the time. Honestly, you can use their reaction against you and they're liars. I mean, they can't help themselves. All right. So number two, the number two way of preventing being triggered by narcissists is to start seeing the signs. Now, once you start understanding what narcissism is, now start recognizing the signs. Start recognizing the signs when they start a coming. Here's one of the most perfect examples. I had a client one time who had a situation in car line. For some reason, she and her ex were dropping their kids off at the same time in the morning. 
They had triplets, three kids that were all the same age. The mother calls me up. I was representing the wife. She calls me up and she says, can you believe he did this? Can you believe he did this? And he said that, and he said this. Can you believe, can you believe, can you believe? And I just kept saying, yes. Yes, I can believe it. Yes, I can believe it. Yes, I can believe it. And at the end of it, I said, what I can't believe is that you can't believe it. You've been telling me that this is how he is for two years. And not only have you been telling me this, when you first visited my office, you gave me many, many pages of notes telling me how he'd been that way for years. So why can't you believe that he did this in Carline this morning? And she actually started laughing and said, you know, you're right. Of course I can believe it. Believe when they act shocked when they don't act like they normally do. So recognize the signs when they lie, when they manipulate, when they gaslight, when they're criticizing you, when they're interrupting you, when they're lining up their flying monkeys, when they're doing the things that narcissists do. I actually call it their to-do list. When you kind of put it into perspective, and you realize that they're going to be the way they are, then it doesn't shock you so much, right? So be aware of the signs. That's number two way of being prevented, uh, preventing yourself from being triggered by narcissists. The third way that you can prevent yourself from being triggered by narcissists is to set super strong boundaries. There are a number of, way, of ways of setting super strong boundaries with narcissists, but I say step one, don't run. Because, you know, they've been conditioning you from the beginning. They're looking to see if you're going to be a good source of supply for them. They want to see, will you do the things they want you to do? Will you allow them to get away with their lying? Will you pour yourself into them when you do things for them. You basically become their secretary, their janitor, you know, you work for them, you service them in every possible way. You allow them to treat you however they want, rage at you, whatever it is. And if you don't do these things, then their behavior gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse, right? So you have to set boundaries. You have to start reconditioning them in a different direction. So you're going to start letting them know that you're not going to tolerate this kind of abuse anymore, that there's a new game in town. Are they going to like it? No. I call it sort of like the narcissist Ferber method, you know? You're just kind of like letting them cry it out a little bit, right? It's going to be hard for you because you're not going to like it initially. It's going to be difficult for you. It's going to be difficult to let them act like they're going to act, okay? But you have to not let them take advantage of you. One of the ways that you can do that is have one form of communication. I recommend email because... There's a time and date stamp, and it's much harder to be manipulated. If you have children together, an, an app is a good way of communicating as well. Something that is much harder for them to manipulate, okay? Number four way of preventing yourself from being triggered by narcissists is not to try to change them. You can change yourself. You can change your behavior. You can change your response to them. You know, respond, don't react, but don't try to change them because they're not going to change. You're going to change in a sense that they're going to be like shocked that you're not behaving in the same way, but they're not going to actually change from being narcissists. They won't become suddenly empathetic, suddenly care. It's not like they're going to wake up and go, wow, I was wrong. You were right. I see the light now. You're amazing. And I'm so sorry. You know, it's not 
like that's going to happen. It's not going to be like that. There's really nothing that you can do to change them. So this is a way for you to prevent being triggered by them. Okay. So, and if you're so ready to slay this, I want you to put slay in the comments right now. Slay. All right. Number five, number five way of preventing being triggered by narcissists. Are you ready for it? Number five, here it comes. Seek outside support because you're going to need it because they are going to line up the guns. With narcissists, you were either for them or against them. Everything is black and white with narcissists. And if they realize that you are no longer for them, then that means that you are against them. So important for self-care, for, for you to have outside support from a narcissist, from friends, family members, therapists, church members, whoever it is that you want to seek outside support from, make sure you do that. Because you you will need it. You absolutely will need it. You will need that emotional help, that spiritual help, that stability. Make sure, you know, as Rumi says, seek those who fan your flames. You, you want people who are fanning your flames, not dousing your fire. Mm-hmm. Keep your circle tight. You want vibrational energy to be protected protect that vibrational energy. Do you feel good after you've been around them? Trust your gut. You want to feel good after you've been around that person. And if you don't, then you know that person's not for you. And, and so that actually brings me into um, another question that I had for you. And it was something that I actually had to struggle with as well when I was dealing with the narcissist in my life is how do you get out of this negative thinking? Because you end up ruminating on it. I mean, you know, in the middle of the night, you wake up, you're thinking about it. You, you wake up in the morning, you're thinking about it. You're brushing your teeth, you're thinking about it. You know, how do you like shift your mindset into, okay, I'm going to create miracles. I'm going to create a positive life and get the results that I want. I, I mean, I teach that, 80% of a negotiation is one before you walk into a room. Um, I, I, I just interviewed, I mentioned to you before we got on, Bob Proctor, and he corrected me and said 95%. And it could be that. But, you know, how do you go from this yeah. ruminating in negativity to, okay, I'm going to win and I can do this? That is, that is a priceless question. And I become a bit of a specialist on how to answer that because of what I've had to go through. Cause I know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, not being able to go to sleep at night because you're working on it. Or when you wake up in the middle of the night, your mind's working on it. Or all through the next day, your mind's working on it. And your mind's working on the worst case scenario. There's no light when the mind is working on a divorce scenario. It is all darkness. It's all what can go wrong. So what did I do here? Okay, first of all, I am aware that we have a choice. In our mind, there are, the, the Indians have said, two wolves. And one is the wolf of faith and one is the wolf of fear. And whichever one wins is the one you feed. So I had to remind myself, feed the faith. Now, I also admit that's not an easy win because when you're going through something that can feel overwhelming, as you know, like a divorce, it can feel like, well, fear's going to win this one because the faith is really low. But I would still realize there's a choice. Second thing I would do is surround myself with positivity, meaning all of this has happened well, for the last year during the pandemic. So my travels, my biggest income, all of that has been wiped out. But I can still surround myself with positivity by what I read, what I listen to, the people I talk to online or on the phone or Facebook, whatever it happens to be. So I can still saturate my brain with the direction I wanna go in. I can make myself more buoyant. The third thing is there's a lot of different techniques I use. One is tapping, which is the emotional freedom technique. I'm sure you know about it. Lots of information on YouTube. People can type in EFT, emotional freedom technique and get lots of videos. I do a Hawaiian healing technique that I know you know about called Ho'oponopono, which would take a whole nother conversation to explain. But I wrote three books on this 
forgiveness, uh, self-awareness technique to find inner peace. And I also, I must say that I have not been backward about calling for help. I have hired counselors, I have hired healers, I have hired mentors, all of it because there have been times when, you know, the dark night was, was sucking me in, was sucking me in. And I just felt like I am not getting out with all the tapping I know, Ho'oponopono I know, the books I know, the techniques I know, my own reputation as a Mr. Positivity, Mr. Fire, self-help guru, none of that would help at certain points. And I would call for help. I would, I have a mentor that I've, uh, or a counselor I've used since 1985, if you can believe that. She's still around and I still call her and she can help walk me through or hold my hand. I think all of these tools and whatever anybody else comes up with on their own are useful, positive, nurturing ways to get through what I guess I'll just call the dark night because those dark nights do show up. So those right. are some ways that I've done it. Yeah. And, and I have to say for myself, I was doing something similar. I mean, it was basically whenever I had what I call like dead space time where I'm not working on something or I'm not, you know, uh, engaged with in a conversation, you know, where I was cooking dinner or walking the dog or, you know, something like that, where, which would be prime bad neighborhood mind stuff. Um, I would listen to something, you know, listen to any kind of positive, anything, stick something on YouTube, put an audio book on anything that's going to have you be thinking about that instead of, you know, the, what could happen sort of thing, or what are they doing now? And I would add one thing that just occurs to me that might be useful to people watching or listening. I really dived into stoicism during this time. And the Stoics, I kind of call them empowered victims because the time period they lived through was pretty dastardly and unpredictable. And they went through far worse things than we've gone through. And we think we've had it bad. They were atrocious. But yet they had a mindset that helped them get through it. And there were some of the poster boys for Stoicism like Marcus Aurelius and Seneca and Epictetus who had quotes that I would rely on. And one of them from Marcus Aurelius said, if you can endure it, then endure it and stop complaining. And I would, I would wake up and go, okay, this divorce is still, there's another unpredictable curveball coming my way. I got to go to court, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> and I would think, can I endure it? Yeah, I can endure it. I don't like it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to endure it, but I can endure it. Yeah. And with that seed of a positivity, I can get through the day. I love that. And the other thing I would tell myself is one day at a time, it's all fine. One day at a time. If my mind projects to a trial date or a, I don't know, a hearing or a phone call or whatever the different legal things that happen, I've already started to forget them, and uh, which is cool, which is also hope for everybody. At some point, you will come out the other side. But during it, I would say one day at a time, it's all fine. I would just focus on today. And as long as I focus on today, it's like, I can handle today. I won't worry about tomorrow. When, when tomorrow's here, it'll be today. And on that day, I'll go, yeah, I can handle it. One day that. at a time, it's all fine. Yeah, that's so good. I, I actually just, when I was, I told you I was in Austin this weekend and in the uh, one of the airports I traveled through, I saw a coffee mug that said, good morning, I see the assassins have failed. <laughs> I love that. I would, I would have bought that. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I love that. I love yeah. that. But you know what you just did there, Rebecca, with a sense of humor? I think that that gets lost during what we'll call a traumatic experience. And yet it's still available. It's still available. It's, it's lost only because our brain sucks us down the survival path and we're feeling sorry for ourselves and we're feeling like a victim. But if we can just, just set a timer or have a friend call or set some kind of reminder to say, go watch some stupid videos on YouTube. I saw a Laurel and Hardy, you know, one of the early slapstick uh, comedians, a Laurel and Hardy clip that was like 60 seconds long. And it was like the dumbest thing I had seen for the longest time. I couldn't stop laughing. 
And it was that laughter is the best medicine, laughter is a stress relief, laughter is a distraction. And all of that is available to us because of Google and YouTube, we don't have to pay anything. So anything like that that can change our mood, get us to look towards the light, get us to focus on the future, get us to up our vibration, it's available to us, it's healthy for us to do, and it can help us get through whatever the experience is. So let's talk about how to have a powerful mindset against narcissists, because honestly, when you're negotiating with them or when you're dealing with them or managing them or trying to deal with any kind of difficult personalities, that's like the most difficult thing. You know, I get a lot of correspondence from people and some of the most satisfying correspondence that I get from people is when people are like, okay, I won my negotiation. I got the results that I wanted, but the most surprising thing that happened to me is that my fear disappeared. But that's actually the most important thing that happens because you cannot get the results you want and you cannot manage difficult people or toxic personalities without that. And that that's actually the thing that has to cut, you have to lead with because they smell blood in the water. And that, that's why they know that they can kind of target you and know that they can control you because they look for people who are empaths. They look for people who are kind of the bleeding hearts, who have some sort of, you know, wounds themselves, who have some sort of, you know, really want to help people who really feel like I can save you, I can... Um, help you. And, and to them, that doesn't mean, oh, I can help you. I can save you. I can, to them, that means, ooh, sap. To them, that means mm, I can take advantage of you. You think, oh, they're going to appreciate me. They're, they're going to, wow, this person saved me. You know, they're going to love me for it. They're, they're going to see all that I did for them. And that ain't going to happen. It's going to end up being a black hole. You're going to end up feeling um, used. You're going to end up feeling abused. It's going to end up being this cycle where you're going to give, give, give. They're, they're going to take, take, take. And it's going to keep going, going, going. And here's like the, the, the really kind of thing that's um, also sort of ironic is like a lot of times people are like, oh, I'm afraid to like become strong against the narcissist because I'm afraid of the backlash. I'm afraid of the things that they're going to do to me. I'm afraid of like what's going to happen because they're going to be worse. Well, yeah, they probably will be worse initially because, you know, you've conditioned them, they've conditioned you, you've kind of conditioned each other in a lot of ways. I mean, a lot of times you have a long history with each other and that you've both kind of created a conditioning of each other. I mean, you both sort of taught each other what you will tolerate or how the relationship is going to go. And there has been some expectations that have been set on both sides as a result. And so creating a powerful mindset means you're also going to have to create some new boundaries, new goals, new way of thinking for yourself as well. So, all right. So number five, I'm going to kind of work backwards with your secrets here. Five secrets to having a powerful mindset against narcissists. So that's kind of like my preface to the whole thing here. But let's let's work backwards with our secrets. So number five, no, number five is start expecting them to behave like narcissists. I know that sounds easy, but it's not all that easy sometimes. I mean, you you can still end up in the trap of like, can you believe they did this? I can't believe they did that. Oh my gosh. I mean, I remember having this conversation with a client one time where she had this huge situation with her soon to be ex in the parking lot of the school. And it was like eight o'clock, eight 30. And she, she calls me at my office and she was like, can you believe he did this right in front of the students, in front of the teachers, everybody was there. 
And I remember saying to my, to her, because she kept saying, can you believe he did? Can you believe, can you believe? And I remember saying, yes, I can. especially after all you've told me about him. What I can't believe is that you can't believe it. She actually started laughing because she was like, oh, good point, fair points. Like, yeah, you know, because like, just, yeah, don't be surprised when they act like themselves, right? They just expect them. There they go. There they are acting like they're narky selves. Don't be surprised when they just act like themselves. So that's secret number five. So now we're going to go to secret number four. Secret number four is to be super specific about what it is that you want. So Having a powerful mindset means what is it that you want? Do you want a certain outcome? Do you want a certain vision? What is the goal of, you know, the negotiation that you want? Is it, you know, a certain parenting plan? If it's a business negotiation, what is the outcome? Sometimes people forget that. It seems so simple, but people often forget. Is it you know, if you're trying to end a business relationship, even if it's not a negotiation, what would be your perfect outcome? You know, is it to just go your own separate ways? Do you want to keep the business? Do you want to sell it? Do you want to dissolve it? What is it that you want? Do you want to keep the clients? Do you not? Be super specific. You know, write it down, maybe write it down and post it everywhere. What goals do you want for your life, for your business, for your career? Watch my interview with Bob Proctor, by the way, which is amazing. It not only, by the way, changed lives of many people who watched that interview, it changed my own life. I, it was like one of my favorite interviews that I've absolutely ever done. So definitely go check that out. So that's secret number two, be super specific. You are placing orders to the universe. By the way, you're placing orders to the universe, even when you say things you don't necessarily want. So, you know, a lot of people say, I don't have enough money. 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 And I wonder why the universe doesn't bring them more money. You know, come on, be careful with what you say. Your words are very powerful. So if you want more money, be careful about what you say. Okay. So that's secret number four. Secret number three is stay laser focused and put your emotions into it. See yourself in your outcome. Feel it. Emotion plus motion equals your outcome. Like really, really feel it you know, the movie, The Secret, they were talking about like feeling yourself in the car, like you're, you feel your, your hands on the steering wheel, you feel the hair, the, the wind in your hair, you know, like really feel it. You have to really feel like what it's like. And like, you can't just like write it down on a piece of paper. You got to really, really feel the emotion of what it is that you want. Because that, that vibrational energy is super, super important. Okay, so if you're doing it, give me an I'm doing it in the comments right now. I'm doing it. I feel the power. I got the emotion. All right, number two, watch your words. No weak language. No, no, I'm trying. I'm hoping. I might. Maybe. I'm sorry. None of that. No weak language, people. Mm -mm -mm -mm. No, I'm doing, I am Yoda. We're Yoda here. Remember Yoda? Do or do not. There is no try. Yes. Love Yoda. All right. And secret number one. Secret number one. This is my own little secret. This is for me as well as for you. I got to do this myself too. Number one for myself is I don't leave my thoughts unsupervised. It, you know, at least for me, my thoughts cannot be left unsupervised. I don't know about you, but I have to like, if I'm, you know, walking the dog or, you know, doing things where my thoughts are left to their own devices, they don't usually go into the good neighborhoods. They usually end up in the bad neighborhoods. So I usually end up 
listening to podcasts, books, you know, audible books, things that will fill my head with the things that I, I want. So, you know, control your input that helps to control your output. So that's what I do. Don't leave your thoughts unsupervised. That is secret number one to having a super powerful mindset. Now, you're getting ready to negotiate with a narcissist. You should never, ever, ever negotiate with a narcissist without these things. So number one is a powerful, powerful, powerful mindset. Remember that you and you alone define your value. You are inherently valuable. And there's different ways to define value, by the way. So, you know, value can be anything from how you feel inside to the value that you bring to the table as far as money or uh, leverage or anything like that. But you define your value. You and you alone define your value. And one thing I really want you to understand is that people will think what you tell them to think. And you want to make sure that you are communicating to these people that you are powerful, that you are the one who's in control. Okay, so that's number one, is make sure that you have a powerful, powerful mindset. The second thing that you should never, ever, ever even think about negotiating without is having all of your arguments ready to go, having your research done, having your leverage ready to go. If you don't have all of your arguments ready and your research done and research on your side, by the way, and also researching as if you are the other person because you want to make sure that you are anticipating what it is that they are going to say. So you do your research on your side and then you also do your risk assessment. You need to make sure, is this an argument I really want to make? Or how much research do I really need to to do and how much money do I want to spend researching? In other words, a lot of times people think, that narcissists are hiding assets or hiding money. And a lot of times they do. And if you want to know more about what, how narcissists hide money or assets, check out my video on what kinds of financial tricks narcissists play, especially in divorce. I have a whole video on that. But they a lot of times do hide money or maybe are are hiding income or maybe they're paid in cash or something like that. So you need to kind of do some risk assessment on that by saying, okay, do I want to hire a forensic accountant? Do I want to hire somebody who can maybe find assets for me? There's guys out there that I know that can find assets even in other countries. But, you know, sometimes you have, I mean, they're expensive sometimes. And sometimes, you know, you have to think about how much money do I want to spend? How much money do I really think is out there? You know, you don't want to spend a few thousand to get back a few thousand. If you're going to spend a few thousand, you want to get back, you know, 50 grand or a hundred grand, right? So do your risk assessment and making sure that you um, are prepared. So that's the next thing. And the next thing is never, ever, ever negotiate without being ready to anticipate the types of emotional triggers that you're going to have. So if you're really, really feeling powerless and you're really, really feeling like the other person is going to have the upper hand on you, then you want to make sure that you are going to be ready for that. And definitely check out my video too on negotiating with someone when you think that they're more powerful than you, because I offer lots and lots more tips on that and just making sure that you come across super, super powerful. So you want to have all of your arguments ready to go. So when I, I want to see in the comments right now that you are going to be ready by saying ready in the comments. The next thing that you want to have ready before you even walk into that room is what your first offer is going to be and also what your choke point is going to be. You want to make sure that 
you have your walk away point because when you get into that room, you are definitely going to be triggered, especially when you're dealing with the narcissist because they want to take you down. That's their goal. They don't want to settle this. Remember, they're getting narcissistic supply from making you squirm and making you miserable. That's why they constantly move goalposts. And you should definitely check out my video on why narcissists move goalposts too. But they don't want to come to a, a, an agreement. They like making you squirm. So you will definitely be triggered. So before you even walk into the room, one of the most important things you have is knowing what your best offer is and what your last offer is going to be. What's your choke point? What's your walk away point? I actually had a, cl a client one time who said, uh, you know, they called it their vomit point. Like that's the part that's, that's the point at which I throw up and walk away, but whatever you want to call it, what's your bottom line? What's the point at which you go, this is it. I'm not negotiating anymore. And it's so important that you come up with all of these things before you walk into the room, because that day will be an emotional day. All right. So never, ever, ever negotiate without being fully prepared, knowing what your first offer is going to be, knowing what your walk away point is going to be, and then sticking to that. Okay. So number one, I'm going to give you eight ways to become powerful and deadly against narcissists. So you're going to want to make sure that you stay all the way till the end eight ways. And number one, recognize the narcissist traits, recognize their behavior, know their triggers. And that way you will know how to provoke them. You're going to know how to become powerful against them. You're going to know what exactly what they're going to be doing. And once you can see it, you can see it coming and that way you will understand how they're going to be behaving. That is one of the best ways that you can become deadly against narcissists. Number two, number two is to be confident in your own self-worth and your own abilities. They absolutely hate that. That's actually one of the best ways to become deadly against narcissists is being confident in your own self-worth and your own abilities. That's number two. Number three is assert yourself when needed and make sure that they know that you are not somebody who will be walked over or used by others. That is so, so, so important. And let me tell you something that is going on with narcissists. You understand that there are three different phases basically to a narcissistic relationship. It's that love bombing, devaluing, and then discarding. And during that love bombing phase, and this is whether it's a personal relationship or a business relationship. And I actually, in my life, had to deal with a narcissist in a business relationship. And so even if you're dealing with them in a business relationship, it's still the same kind of a thing. Sometimes that love bombing phase is also called the idealization phase. And during that phase, they are actually conditioning you. They're setting you up. They're looking to see if you're going to be a good form of what they call narcissistic supply or what is called narcissistic supply. They want to see if they're going to be able to kind of get away with their behavior. They're conditioning you. They're looking to see how you're going to respond when they start devaluing you, when they start ghosting you, when they start acting in a certain way, when those red flags start popping up and you start to kind of go, well, you know, I don't want to rock the boat. I'm going to go along to get along. I don't know if I should say anything. A lot of times it's just so subtle. You're and you're just not sure what's going on here. You, a lot of times are an empathic person or you're a good person. You know, they look for people that are that are good people who are not quite sure. And, you know, and a lot of times it's encased in a lot of great other things. So you're like, well, there's a lot of 
other good behavior that's kind of good. So you're not really sure. And so what happens is you've been conditioned. And so now you have to start asserting yourself. If you want to start to shift the dynamic, if you want to start to change how things are going to be, you have to start incrementally shifting so that you're now actually changing the power dynamic. And that's what you have to start doing. So number three is asserting yourself when needed. And now you're actually no longer allowing them to walk over you. And it's actually going to, it's going to start to feel uncomfortable for you because you're not used to it. If you've been a victim of a narcissist, it's, you know, you get nervous about how they're going to react and, and they will react because narcissists, you know, they'll start to have their tantrums, but you know, you just have to kind of get through that phase. It's almost like having a two-year-old, you know, where you have to kind of get through that phase where they will react and, and you just have to understand that that's what they're going to do. So that's number three. And number four is sort of closely related. So number four is establishing boundaries with the narcissist and including setting clear rules for what is going to be acceptable behavior, what's going to be tolerated and avoid giving in to their demands and being okay with understanding that, you know, it may end up getting worse and that's okay because it, it will probably get worse before it gets better, but it will end up getting better and understand that this is the only way to get a narcissist to respect you. And I do have a whole video on much more about that and definitely check out my video. It's actually called, this is the only way to make a narcissist to respect you. Definitely check that out. The next one is stay strong, stay strong, especially if you are feeling low or vulnerable, remind yourself that all the good qualities about yourself, you know, just stay strong. The next one is know that you deserve better. Know that you deserve better than a relationship with a narcissist. And, you know, right now I want you to just put in the comments, stay strong, stay strong. All right. Number seven is keep your distance, keep your distance because they will start to hoover you. They will start to come back. They're going to start to, you know, try to test you to see if you're going to be weak. They're going to try to see if maybe there's some holes in your boundaries. They're going to see if maybe you are going to allow them to come back in some way or that, you know, maybe that there's some way that they can come back and get some more supply out of you. And so you really, really have to make sure that you're going to let them know that no, you are distancing yourself as much as possible. And number eight is just remember who it is that you are dealing with. Remember, they are not going to change. Remember that you are not going to get closure from this situation. You are not going to be able to get them to understand your position. You are never going to be able to get them to acknowledge anything that you ever did. I mean, that was one of the hardest things for me. I had a business situation with a narcissist. I gave and gave and gave and gave. And I really thought that I would be able to have some sort of closure and that I would be able to have some sort of at least cordial relationship going forward. And I really, really worked hard on trying to make sure that things would be as good as possible, even giving as much as I possibly could. And no matter what you do, no matter how much you try, they just aren't ever going to be able to do that. You know, you're dealing with a person who is just inherently a broken person. And, and yes, you can have empathy for that person, but that doesn't mean that you can fix them. That doesn't mean that you're going to have closure. That doesn't mean that you can do anything for them other than namaste and walk away, you know, wish them well, walk away. You can heal yourself. You can thank them for the gift of showing you who they really are 
and go and find yourself somebody who is whole and complete and deserves you and deserves your time. All right. So the narcissist, they get in your head. They just drive you crazy. So you are so ready to stop caring. And I'm going to tell you how to do it. I'm Rebecca Zung. I am a narcissist negotiation expert. I'm also a lawyer and I am so committed to helping you just shut them down, stop the madness. I've helped thousands of people go from these lives of drama, trauma, and chaos to step into lives of freedom, possibility, and purpose. And how I do that is by helping you shift the dynamic, get the hell out of this craziness. And if that sounds good to you, then subscribe to this channel and hit that notification bell. All right, so ready? Number one is you gotta realize that how they think, what they do, all their crazy crap, it actually has nothing to do with you. I know they tell you it has everything to do with you. They blame it all on you. They want to push all their crap on you. It actually has nothing to do with you. It, it, you're just the collateral damage because you actually ended up getting sucked into their world. By the time you're done, it's going to be, they're going to move on to somebody else and then it's going to be them, them. It really has nothing to do with you. It's all about them. They're the ones that have the problem. They have the problem. You just were the ones that they glommed onto. They're looking for narcissistic supply. They were looking for somebody to give them that supply. And remember, by the way, what I always say, which is they didn't attach themselves to you because you had so little value. They attached themselves to you because you had so much. They need the supply. Why they that they glommed onto you was for the value. Remember what they do and, and, and their whole thing. They're the ones that are screwed up in the head. They, they, they have no inner sense of value. You cannot take how they act personally. You can't. You got to stop. It, it has nothing to do with you. How people treat other people is always a direct reflection of the way they feel about themselves, good or bad, period. If people treat other people well, it's because they feel good about themselves inside. People treat other people poorly is because they don't feel good about themselves inside. Well, it has nothing to do with even being narcissists or not. Just remember that. A great book, by the way, is The Four Agreements. And one of the agreements, it's four agreements you make with yourself. yourself. And one of the agreements is you never take anything personally because, you know, the way people treat other people is a direct re reflection of the way they feel about themselves. So realize how narcissists treat people is because they don't feel good about themselves. To care about how they treat you is you're taking something personally when it, it's just they don't feel good about themselves. You can't. So... That's number one. Like I almost could stop there in a way, but I, I want to give you some other good things. All right. So that's, that's number one. Number one way to stop caring what the narcissist thinks right now is just don't take it personally that, that it, it doesn't have anything to do with you and just start to understand them, start to understand narcissists, start to understand that there are different types of narcissists, who you're dealing with, you know, and I do have a video on the three main kinds of narcissists. If you want to start understanding what it is that you're dealing with, if you want to check that out. Number two, stop trying to please them. Stop trying to feed that beast. It's a black hole. You're not going to be able to. You are going to drain all the life out of yourself. You're making deposits. You're never going to get withdrawals back in. Your, your soul will feel like it's being drained until you feel 
like there's nothing left of yourself. So you are going to have to be the one to change. If you're truly in a relationship with a narcissist, whether it's business or personal, and I know I've been it, I've been there in, in a business relationship and it wasn't even all that long. And I felt like I was like the life was being drained out of me. I literally, I kept saying leech. I didn't even know the words energy vampire and all of these terms. I had, I didn't have the vocabulary yet. The word I was using was leech or parasite. You know, stop trying to please them. That's number two. You have to be the one to change. Number three, stop taking responsibility for them. They will let you do everything for them. They will. And they will not give you credit for it. They will certainly take credit for all the things that you do. Oh, yeah been there, done that, and they won't acknowledge you for it. They won't thank you for it and stop defending them. So stop doing everything for them. Stop taking responsibility for them. Start taking care of yourself. Stop feeling guilty. You got to take care of you. That's number three. Number four, you got to start setting boundaries. Start setting boundaries and start creating a plan to either go no contact or minimum contact. That's how you're going to start to heal because they, they want to trigger you. They know how to trigger you. They've been conditioning you since the day they light, laid eyes on you, since you started to have conversation or interaction with this person. They've been conditioning you to have you think that they're so smart and they're so cunning and they're so stealth and they're all these things. They're not as smart as you might think. Let me just say that. So you just need to shut them down. And I want you to put that in the comments right now, shut them down so that you can start to put that into your head. I want you to just start to condition your brain that that's what you're going to be doing. Shut them down. And number five is start practicing self-care. You know, whether it's listening to videos on a regular basis, I always say, I don't leave my thoughts unsupervised because they, they start to get into your brain patterns and all of that. It's really hard not to obsess over what they're doing. The heart palpitations, all of those things. Mel Robbins has a, a really fantastic thing that she talks about, which is, you know, first thing in the morning when you wake up, put your hand over your heart and just say, I'm okay. I am safe. I'm loved. Oh, love that. You can do, do something like that. Really easy. And you can do that at any time of the day. Put post-it notes, reminding yourself of your mantras. If, if you're in a place where you can do that, start creating your exit plan, listen to audiobooks, get your support system together, your support team, whether it's your friends, your family, a pastor or a therapist, create a plan for your future. Whether it's a business relationship, figure out how you're going to get out of this situation you know, whatever it is that you need to do, start to do it. So let's talk about the narcissist projection. How fun is that? It's so fun when they're trying to tell, accuse you of what it is that they're doing or accuse you of something because they want to take the responsibility off of themselves. That's what projection is. So basically what it is, is if you are accusing them of being irresponsible, then all of a sudden you are the irresponsible one, or that maybe it's somebody else. They like to project onto somebody else too. Um, I used to have a paralegal who worked for me, who often always projected her um, ir irresponsibility onto somebody else. It was always because she was waiting on an email, because she didn't get the email, because she made a phone call and no one called her back. Because, you know, and so it was always projecting her irresponsibility onto someone else. And I'm not saying that it doesn't happen sometimes where, you know, things don't fall through the cracks or whatever. I'm talking about a way of life, a way of being of, you know, if somebody says, um, you're crazy, then you become the one that's crazy. And so they project it back onto you. And why do narcissists do this? They do this because they have a very fragile sense of self and they really cannot it's all, it's, it's, it's a survival mentality. They cannot 
take responsibility for anything that's going to make them look bad in any way. They, that's why they don't say sorry. Anything that's going to take away from that fragile sense of self in their mind, it just, they, they're now exposed, it shatters, and, and that's it. You know, now the world knows how worthless they feel inside. And, you know, I, I do view narcissism as a continuum. Basically, you know, all of us want to feel seen, heard, and know that we matter, right? That's part of being a human being. And all people, you know, do things that, you know, want to, you know, allow them to feel more valuable. I mean, even if you're the most altruistic person in the world and all you're doing is helping the poor or homeless or whatever, it, you're, you're doing it so that you can feel good, so that you know that your life matters. Um, if you tell people about your accomplishments or things like that, none of that makes you a narcissist, okay? What, what, what makes you a narcissist is as you go toward the end of the continuum and now you're all you care about is yourself and you have no idea about anybody else's feelings, nor do you care. Now you're at the end of the continuum and now it's sort of a pathological issue where, you know, you are a narcissist. And if you are a narcissist, that means that you have no sense of self. It means that somewhere along the way, you were injured in some way, traumatized in some way, hurt in some way. And you came to this conclusion as a child that the world is not a safe place, that it's a me or you world. And if it's, if it's, if it's gotta be one of us, it's gotta be me. And so I'm not going to give anything, anything to you. And so what happens when they get accused of things is they can't hold that on themselves. So they've got to push it away and they're going to push it away and push it onto you or whoever is around them, whoever they can to push it onto. And sometimes when they're projecting, they actually even lie. And if you want to know what happens when you catch a narcissist in a lie, check out my video on what happens when you catch a narcissist in a lie. But projection is one of those things that they do to de de deflect anything away from themselves. And that's one of the things that happens when they lie as well, which is deflect. And if you've seen this before, you've been the recipient of a narcissist projection. Give me a totally in the comments. Okay, so now you're dealing with this projection thing and what can you do about it? Uh, and this especially happens at, at a time when you're starting to negotiate with them. Maybe the relationship is starting to break down. You're starting to see that the birth of that smear campaign. And by the way, if you want to know how to shut down a narcissist smear campaign, check out my video on shut down a narcissist smear campaign. But anyway, what happens is as this is happening to you, you start to feel really, really defensive. And your first inclination is to fight back. Your first inclination is to go, um, that's not me. And what are you saying? And that's you. Um, and uh, you're accusing me of exactly what you are and, and, and fighting back. And what happens at that point is now you're down into it. You're in the mud. There's nowhere for you to go. Uh, and you're exactly where they want you to be, by the way. So the first thing I want you to do when a narcissist is projecting on you is just stop. Stop and observe and listen and take a breath and go, I know what's happening here. You don't have to say that out loud, but you can say that to yourself and go, okay, I see what's happening here. This person is projecting onto me, and if I fight back, and if I go, you know, any further in this, it's not going to end well for me. So let me just stop for a second and take a breath, and that'll give you a moment to get your composure, to, to get your emotions under control, to see what's happening, and, and, and think before you act. So that's number one. 
The second thing that you can do is keep your emotions in check and not take that bait. You know, you can just go, okay, I see what you're saying and I understand that that's your position and um, I see that you're upset. And if you want to know about more phrases to disarm a narcissist, check out my video on phrases to disarm a narcissist. But in the meantime, you can just take, you know, stock of what's going on, see it, don't get emotionally engaged. I always tell people to just take a look at it as if you're a third party observer, as if you are a person who's watching what's happening, you, you don't have any emotion in it. And so when you take yourself out of that, then they don't have anything to project onto. You know, it's just not sticking. It's sort of like, just imagine it's sort of like coming up against you, but you're like Teflon. It just falls to the floor and goes away. Okay, so that's the second thing. And the third thing is, for sure, do not fight back. Don't take the bait. Because if you do that, you're not going to get anywhere. And you're really, really going to end up making things worse for yourself. You're going to end up being upset. Let me just tell you this. You are not going to convince that narcissist that you are right. It ain't going to happen. So there's no good coming out of this. They're not going to turn around and go, oh, you know, I see your point. You're right. I'm so sorry. I was the one who did that to you. It, it, you know, this whole uh, being aware of self and uh, being full enough and whole enough and complete enough to be able to come forward and, and take responsibility, that's not going to happen in that moment. I mean, some narcissists, I suppose, do go and get help. 99.9% .9 of them probably don't. And so don't expect that that's going to happen in this particular situation either. So why am I talking about quantum law and karma and all of these things when I am a lawyer? I'm going to tell you why right now. Because mindset is 50% of winning a negotiation and intention is a huge part of that. 80% of a negotiation is won before you even walk into the room. It because, because it comes to your planning and preparation, yes, of course, but it is a huge part of it is your, is your mindset. It is one of the most important parts of it. And mindset also has to do with your thoughts and your thoughts are energy. And what quantum law says is that what, whatever energy you're putting out there, that's the energy that you're going to get. Like attracts like it's just physics. Okay. And so when you are like forming a thought in your mind and you're placing that thought out into the world, you are basically placing an order to the universe. And you're saying to the universe, this is what I want to have happen. This is how I want it to go. So if you say things to the universe, like I'm never going to get that he or she always gets their way. I can never win. I'm not even going to try to get this particular thing because it, it's never going to happen. The universe goes, okay, because whatever your little beams of thought are, th that energy that you place out into the world, that's what comes back to you. Your thoughts are literally just protons, neutrons, and electrons, and ions, all just floating around in your brain. That's all they are. You can't feel them. You can't touch them. As fast as they come into your brain, they can go back out of your brain. Let's just try an experiment right now. I want you to think about I want you to close your eyes and I want you to think about a white picket fence. Just hold that in your mind. Now let it go. Is it, is it still there? No, it's not. It's gone. And, and it's the same thing with your thoughts. The only thing is when you start to have beliefs, that just means that it's a thought that you've thought over and over and over again. And now it's become a belief. And now you just believe that it's true. But it's only because you've been thinking it so many times that it becomes like true to you. 
but it doesn't mean it's necessarily true. If you want to know more about power thinking when it comes to narcissists, make sure to check out my video called Power Thinking When It Comes to Narcissists because making sure you have a powerful mind is going to be so, so important. So what happens when you're when you're harnessing the power of quantum law is you're basically lining up the, the, the power of the universe to say, this is how I want it to go. You're, 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 it's almost like you're putting, you're setting your GPS and you know, if you're driving from Los Angeles to San Diego and you don't know how to get there, you're going to put a thing in your GPS and you're just going to assume that you're going to drive there. At no point do you go, well, maybe I'm going to get there. My, maybe it's going to happen. Maybe not. You know, maybe I'll end up in, in, you know, Oregon or something like that. You don't think that, right? But that's what we do with our thoughts. We go, okay, well, I, I think I'd like this to happen, but maybe it won't. Maybe I'll end up over here. Maybe I'll end up over there. You can't You can't do that when you are harnessing the power of quantum law because, you know, the the universe of of physics is such that it will respond to exactly what you put out there. Like attracts like. That is a physics law. And so your thoughts are going to beam out into the energy and whatever it is that you put out there is going to come back to you. So the first step in actually beating that narcissist is believing that you can and not only believing it, but knowing it with every cell of your body that this is how it's going, no matter what. This is the direction that it's going to head. I am going to receive this. I am going to let them know that I am more powerful. They are going to see that they are no longer the more powerful one, that they are no longer the one who's controlling me. I am the one who's in control. I am the one who's in control of my thoughts, my life, my outcomes. And then that's how it ends up going to go. The universe wants to respond to you. It it absolutely is at the ready. It's like the soldiers who are just, as soon as you clap, boom, there they are. What would you like? But you have to let them know what it is. Because if you say, I'm never going to win, I shouldn't even bother to try, then that's how it's going to go. And the other thing that's really, really important is that you need to make sure that you are not saying things to the, the, the universe that's going to make the universe believe that you're not in control. And by saying things like, I'm a victim, I can never win or I need a good lawyer, or somebody else has to help me, or I need more money, or all of those kinds of things. You're basically saying to the universe, I don't have it now. I'm not in control. I can't do it. The way things are now, it's not going to happen. And then that's what's going to happen. You've placed that, that order to the universe. So if you are a winner, and you're changing your mindset to be a mindset of a winner, then I want to see I'm a winner in the comments right now. Go ahead, write it. I'm a winner. I want you to start saying that to yourself over and over and over again. That's your mantra. I am a winner. I uh, recently read a book called Untamed by Glennon Doyle, which was really, really great, especially if you're a woman. I don't know, maybe guys would like it too, but um, it was really a good book. And one of the things that she said was her mantra in that book was, uh, I can do hard things. And, you know, at first I was like, I don't know, I can do hard things. Is that a good mantra? And then I started to like think, think about it. It was like, okay, now, yeah, if, if I'm getting ready to do something that maybe feels like a challenge or maybe I'm afraid of, 
then, you know, just say to yourself, I can do hard things. Um, and another one that I read one time was a book by uh, Elizabeth Gilbert. And I think the book was Big Love. Um, and we'll make sure we drop links to these books down below if you want to check them out. Um, no obligation, but you, if you want to check them out, you can. Um, and it, anyway, the book in the book Big Love, Elizabeth Gilbert talks about fear. And she talks about how anytime she does something new, she used to say, oh, I have to get rid of fear. I, I can't have fear come with me no matter what, you know, I, I've, I've got to figure out a way to like get rid of it. Well, but the truth is that none of us ever completely figure out a way to operate into a new world or a new thing without any fear whatsoever. The courage is doing it in the face of fear, right? Like the cowardly lion in, in, in The Wizard of Oz. And so what Elizabeth Gilbert says in that book is that she has learned to go, okay, and, and like have a conversation with fear and say, all right, fear, we're going on a trip, we're doing this thing, and we're gonna get in the car, and you know, I understand that you're gonna have to come along. I would like for you not to come along, but I understand that you're coming along against my wishes, so okay, fine, fear, you get to come, but you definitely do not get to drive. You have to sit in the back seat. I'm driving. You don't get to drive. You don't get to navigate. You definitely do not even get to touch the radio. You don't get to touch, play the songs. You just have to sit there and shut up while I'm doing this thing and I'm driving. So fear you're coming, but I'm driving. And I thought that was a beautiful, beautiful analogy. So if you want to use quantum law to beat that narcissist, the thing you have to do is start with your thoughts. Start like pinging into the universe. Remember, like attracts like. So what you ping out pings right back to you. It's like a boomerang. So if you want good things to start coming to you, you better start being very, very aware of the things that you're pinging out into the universe so that the right things start pinging back to you. And that's the way you're going to start the path of beating that narcissist. Okay. So we're going to go through the top five mistakes that people make when dealing with narcissists. And I've seen these when people are negotiating with narcissists and also in dealing with them. And I've also made them myself in dealing with the narcissists that I've had to deal with. I had to deal with a couple of covert narcissists in my personal life as well, one in a business setting and one in a family setting. The one I'm saving for last is the reason why I really wanted to make this video. Okay. So stay tuned for that. Okay. So number one is do not make the mistake of falling into the trap of their future faking. They will future fake you. They will make you think that they've changed. What happens is you will leave. You will maybe come back. You will think that they have changed. They have not changed. Okay. Do not think that they have changed. Do not fall for that. Do not come into thinking that they may have changed. I have interviewed people on this. I have talked to people on this. You can listen to my interviews on this. You can talk to people on this. Don't think that they have changed. They have not changed. Unfortunately, they just don't. So don't fall for that. That's one of the top five mistakes that we make is falling for the future fake, thinking they may have changed when they have not. Don't fall for it. You know what future faking is, right? It's like things are going to be better now, blah, blah, blah. It's kind of like a love bomb, but it's already happened. Like you're, you're already in the relationship. And when you're trying to hold them accountable for something and them saying, oh, things are going to be different now thing. Don't look into the past, look to the future. Don't think that they're going to change. They won't. It's all a manipulation. Okay. Number two is don't think that you're going to get closure from them. You're not going to. Okay. Just forget about it. I thought that I was going to be able to get closure in my relationship with the, the business narcissist, 
And you just, you can't. I thought that I was going to be able to have a nice amicable relationship going forward. You can't. And I've seen people fall prey to this many times as well. And you're just not going to be able to do that. As much as you try to wrap things up in a nice little bow and move forward nicely, they're just not capable. They're just too wounded. And so as as much as you think that you're going to try to get that closure, you're going to have to get your own closure. Just knowing that you can move forward, knowing that you are healed, knowing that you are going to be a better person from everything that you're learning from this situation, that's the closure that you're getting. The next big mistake that we make in dealing with narcissists is hoping for acknowledgement from them and thinking that you're going to maybe get acknowledgement for anything that you contributed to the relationship because you're not going to get it. You're not going to get acknowledgement from them. They're not going to say, oh yeah, you're right. You did a good job or, oh yeah, you're right. You contributed to my career or yeah, you helped me in that situation or you made my life better in this way. You're not going to get that. They're not going to make it seem like, sure, you get to take credit for anything. In fact, if anything, they're going to make it look like you're the problem. You know, I have a whole video on that, you know, five ways that they actually try to make you look like the problem. And you can check out my video on that. So they're definitely not going to give you credit for anything. And and so we make this mistake of thinking, try to give me credit for this. Try to give me, acknowledge me. And if I could just talk to you one more time, if I could just get you to see, stop, stop banging your head against that wall. Banging your head against a brick wall would actually be more satisfying. That's the next big, huge mistake. And if you agree with me so far, give me a totally in the comments. All right. And the next one is expecting any kind of loyalty whatsoever. You're not going to get any kind of loyalty. The only loyalty that they have is to the highest bidder for their supply. You know that they need an endless amount of narcissistic supply. They, you know that they, they're going to go to wherever the best form of supply is that they can get. And so that's where they're going to go. I mean, they're, they're going to go to wherever they can get it. They're like vultures. So if, if down the road, there is a better form of it, that's where they're heading. I mean, they're not going to have loyalty toward you if there's a better form of supply somewhere else. So you can't take that personally because it really doesn't have anything to do with you. It only has to do with them. Okay, you ready for the last one? This is really the reason why I wanted to do this video. I was actually gonna maybe just do the video on just this topic. I was actually thinking about maybe just doing it on the one big mistake that we make with narcissists. But then I thought, well, there's so many. So I, I, I decided I, I didn't mention the other ones, but this is really one that I see so often in negotiating that I thought I have to mention this one, okay? And that is thinking any sort of like this gratuitous giving is going to garner some sort of favor down the road. It doesn't, okay? So if you think that you're negotiating with them in some way and that giving them something on the front end is going to get you something on the back end, you're like totally kidding yourself because it's not. They're just going to take it and like, okay, great. And your point is what? It's like, it's done. They have it. And that's it. And now they want more. So what I see a lot of times is people will say, well, I'm going to show them how nice I'm being because I'll show them I'm, I don't want any part of their retirement or I'll show them that I won't touch this or I won't ask them for support or whatever, giving up leverage. And then they just take that. And then they realize down halfway into the case that they're like, did it didn't help at all. The narcissist is being horrible and horrendous. 
anyway. And now they've given up that leverage. Now they wish they hadn't been that way or they didn't hire the good lawyer, or they didn't get a, a custody agreement done at the beginning, like their lawyer told them to, or whatever it was that they didn't do, because they thought that this gratuitous giving will garner some sort of favor for them down the road. It doesn't. It's a big lie. It's a big fat waste of time. They will not honor agreements. They'll just take and they will not see that and acknowledge that. And you're just going to end up feeling used and abused. Let me just tell you, if they were a lying, denying, horrible spouse, they're not going to be better during the divorce. And by the way, this goes for if you're breaking up in a business relationship or any kind of a relationship. This is a massive mistake that I see with people. That somehow you think that if you show them how nice you are, that they're going to see that and that you'll be rewarded for that. You won't. Don't fall into that trap. You got to take care of yourself. You got to do what you have to do to end up at fair. And don't feel guilty for that. Do what you have to do to take care of yourself. Do what you have to do to take care of your family if you have kids. That's my thought on that.